Hello, Monetization Nation. I'm Nathan Gwilliam, your host. Today, my guest is Ethan Butte. Ethan is the chief evangelist at BombBomb. He's the host of the Customer Experience Podcast and co-author of Human-Centered Communication and Rehumanize Your Business. In today's episode, we're going to discuss how we can humanize our businesses by avoiding digital pollution. We'll cover the following key takeaways. Number one, digital pollution refers to the confusion, frustration, and annoyance we create in the digital world. Number two, to avoid digital pollution, we should focus on creating human-centered communication and relationships. Everything we do online should be focused on providing value to our customers. Number three, we should look to establish guidance and find guidance from those we respect. Number four, we should make it easy for people to understand our identity and motivation. Number five, by verifying our identity, we make it safer and easier for people to say yes to us. And number six, we want to create engagement with our customers to build our relationships. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Sure. Thank you so much for the invite. Thanks for the kind words. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure finally after, you know, countless hours of work by countless people um, to have the ideas out in the world in the form of a book. Okay. Can you start off with us sharing something that you are super passionate about? Um, I, you know what? It's funny. The way this book came together, which is based on 11 different interviews with 11 different people and this framework um, that was the result of an internal team that I was not invited into, um, human center communication. Uh, the thing that is probably the most personal to me uh, in this book is actually one of my greatest passions too, which is uh, the idea that clean air, clean water, and clean soil are absolute necessities and precursors to human thriving. So, um, you know, whenever possible, I look for an opportunity to talk to people about clean air, clean water, and clean soil. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm just someone that, that recognizes that it's easy to trade off um, long-term needs for short-term, I'm air quoting for listeners, wins. So in the physical world, give you an example, uh, I took a job for a company and I relocated to uh, Bountiful, Utah and a uh, beautiful, beautiful place. And I lived up on a hill and in the winter time they had inversion um, where it actually kept the pollution down and contained it because of some temperature issues that, that happened there in the valley. And it was, it was really nasty. I, I lived above the inversion and you could look down and just see this gross haze where we didn't have what you're talking about here. We didn't have the clean air. And, and I realized that, you know, there were a couple of oil refineries that were down in that valley that just, uh, and, and with all the cars and all the other types of emissions and things that just filled it. And, and then with the inversion effect, it, it couldn't get out. And, and, uh, I ended up, uh, leaving that company and I, I loved the city, but just because the, the biggest reason we moved was the the unclean air, the dirty air that was there. And I just, I couldn't handle living in a place where um, I was just breathing that air every single day. So you're right. That is a, that is a precursor to life in the physical world. Now you talk about in your book, um, your subtitle is a business case against digital pollution. Will you talk about what, what do you mean by digital pollution and, and how is that related to this physical pollution that, that we all dislike? Sure. So, so just to take on the physical pollution briefly, you know, we, we made a run at it, which again was something driven by my personal passion. It's probably the, chapter one and chapter 16 are probably the most personal to me. Um, and the rest is capturing other people's ideas and, and trying to refine them. So I think Nathan, you'll, have your own examples here in just a moment. So I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time on digital pollution because everyone knows that it exists. Generally speaking, it's confusion, frustration, annoyance, perhaps threat or danger that we feel when we're in 
digital, virtual, and online environment. So at the kind of silly, annoying, frustrating end um, is maybe a group text message or a group LinkedIn message where all of a sudden you just you know pick up your phone and there are like 85 messages. You're like, what happened? Oh, someone put me in a group message that I didn't need to be in. Uh, now my phone's blown up. It's not a big deal, but it's kind of silly and frustrating. Also, you know, whether you're the sender or the receiver, it's that um, embarrassing or comical or misleading typo or auto correction, those types of things that happen. But it slows us down, it confuse us, confuses us, frustrates us, annoys us, et cetera. On the far other end, the dangerous end is ransomware, malware, phishing attacks, denial of service attacks, and all these other cyber crimes that have given rise to a multi-billion dollar industry um, that's constantly on the chase for the latest, you know, to, to address the latest tactics in trying to swindle us, cheat us, and uh, and maybe even bring a company or an organization down. But where the most interesting conversation is, is in the big fat middle, something that we call consequential pollution. It's what we do as individuals and as companies, and it's what we experience as individuals and companies when someone is going about the attempt to create or deliver value, but they do it in a way that confuses, frustrates, annoys us. Um, and it doesn't help us out in the way that we need as human beings because, you know, in general, these these environments, digital, virtual, and online spaces are emotionally and visually impoverished. They don't give humans what they need. Um, and, you know, without going too far down the road and give you a chance to add on and redirect me, um, you know, we often find ourselves behaving or experiencing behavior that no individual would ever intentionally do to like another person, a friend or a family member. But somehow in a business context, it becomes okay to do these things, even though we know that it confuses, frustrates, and annoys people. So what do you think? When I say, when you read Digital Pollution, what are some examples that came to mind for you? So I haven't read the whole thing yet, but going back, here's, here's, the, here's the direction that I would like to take it. You talk about Digital pollution is bad, just like that air is bad, the, the, the pollution that I was seeing when I, when I lived in Bountiful. And the answer for me is I moved out into the rural Idaho, you know, got, got acres of land and I have clean air and, and no pollution at all. As you just talked about, you gave a lot of examples of things we don't like. And, and so I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I hate when people say, for your security, that has just become like Parata t uh, parataxic distortion uh, for me. It, it, it is a, uh, it's, it's almost a traumatic experience when people use the phrase for your security, because that's them trying to defend them doing something they know is going to annoy the heck out of you. Right. And you're having to go through six stages of re-enter your password. And I'm going to send you a code on your phone and you're going to have to pick how many motorcycles are on the screen here. And you, you have to go through all of these different steps just to log into your stupid bank account. Right. And, um, and, uh, and if you dare be on a business trip in, Brazil and try to log in to something, right? They put you through, like, you have to talk to someone on a phone to even get through a lot of these security things. And, and um, they claim it's for your protection, but can you imagine doing that to someone in the real world? Can you imagine someone walking into your physical business and making them go through, you know, eight minutes of, of, proving they are who they are and verifying on all their different devices. And it is, it is so annoying. It is, I mean, that's, that is the, one of the worst examples of digital pollution that I hate. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I think an easy one that any listener will recognize too. I mean, I'm certain, I'm sure that there were heads nodding as you were explaining that. And what really got me the moment rise where I truly felt you on that was, you know, pick, pick the images with the motorcycle. <laughs> you're like, you're, you're just leaning in and squinting your eyes. Is that like, a is motorcycle? That I can't quite that? tell. <laughs> These circles are those tires. What is that? You know, and then they make you do it again because you maybe got, anyway, you're even a human doing the best you can and it's still not even good enough. And they make you right. Um, so, you know, it's that LinkedIn connection request where as soon as you accept it, you get the six paragraph copy paste with like, you know, four links and a, a link to a calendar, just this presumptuous over the top behavior. That's so transactional. And again, so let's take either or both of these. I mean, you did a nice job of introducing, let's take what you just described and put it in the real world. You know, we can do the same thing with this LinkedIn connection request and the is a little bit trite, but you know, imagine we're at some kind of a social event, whether it's a networking event or a cocktail event 
event or, you know, a, a break at a conference or something, and you introduce yourself to someone else and you exchange names and all of a sudden they just start talking at you for three and a half minutes straight about what they do for their business. <laughs> they make assumptions about who they think you are, you know, based on your title and these kinds of things. And, you know, you, they immediately pull out their phone and they start asking you for like dates to schedule a meeting, you know, and these types of things. Like, I don't know you, you know, like we literally... And you don't know me. You have no idea what I even need or want. Literally like 10 seconds ago, just decided that it would be worth potentially opening a conversation. And then you just immediately like jump forward. So, you know, the, and, and I want to draw, I want to give, um, I'm going to give listeners some permission here. So what we're trying to do with this book and this message and this idea of exploring digital pollution, which is a collection of effects, you know, I think it also includes some social issues, including, you know, the Facebook, Instagram news that came out, you know, that they have internal research, that they knew that they were damaging an entire generation of young women. But, you know, just the social, the, the negative social and emotional and spiritual and sometimes even physical consequences of of just the online experience um it's obviously noisy we've all used that word for a long time but we're trying to take it a step farther with pollution and establish where in fact it crosses that line from just being you know because our watches for example or our rings and some of these wearable devices are also kind of noisy apparently some people are getting refrigerators that will notify them that they're getting low on something that's normally not low in the refrigerator. So like, you know, so things are beeping and dinging and begging for our attention, which is precious. Um, so there's a lot of noise, but we're trying to take it this step farther with pollution. And so the goal here, by the way, and I'm going to take it back to the refineries in the inversion in Bountiful in the Valley. Um, you know, there's no easy answer here. And, you know, I think we would all agree that we do want oil to be refined. Most of us would would agree that we want it to be refined. There's no easy layup solution. We're just trying to create awareness and create a conversation here so that um, people can make better decisions for their business because we're getting to a point where individuals and then increasingly machines will restrict your ability to reach the people that you need to reach to be successful if you're just giving them you know, a, a worse experience rather than a positive one. So let's talk about what the positive it, with pollution. We know that clean air is what we're striving for. Well, and I guess that's not always possible. Maybe salt, the Salt Lake Valley, you know, or Davis County, maybe they can't solve that problem. Well, I guess you could move a refinery or you could put, you know, things in there that, that clean the air somehow. But if clean air is what we're looking for in, in the physical world, Let's let's talk more about what the solution is. What is the clean air in, in the digital landscape? Sure. Again, perfection is not the goal here. We're looking to get better. To your observation there, I'm sure someone is working on technology to make refineries uh, cleaner for the people that live near them or downwind or whatever the case may be. In this case, you know, we use the language human-centered communication. We're taking the principles of human-centered design, which is a 30 or 40-year-old practice. Uh, we can get into more detail on that if you, would, if you would like to. But essentially, what we would do in applying human-centered design to our daily digital communication is put other people's needs, wants, and interests on a level playing field or on equal footing as our own. That's to say, before we type a line or before we record a video or before we undertake the effort of creating a message or experience for somebody, we think about what's in it for them. Now you might be saying, you know, whether it's you, Nathan, or a listener like, well, duh, yeah, of course, why wouldn't we? Well, great question. Why don't we? We don't. We're so often in a rush. We're busy. Our approach, if we're even conscious of it at all, tends to be, what do I need to do here or say here to get someone to do what I want? And, you know, that that's not, that, that's potentially benign. It's a little bit selfish or lazy. Um, I, I'm of the sincere belief that in the future, what is going to be the most effective for us 
is to think first about other people's needs, wants, and interests. To the degree we can do it on a truly personal basis, all the better. But many people are operating in a business model where, you know, I'm dealing at volume. I can't make every touch bespoke. Um, and so then obviously we need to do things that most people are doing, like work with an ideal customer profile or a persona or that type of a thing. You know, go in instead of just, you know, mass blasting everybody this thing because, you know, you start with your own needs or your wants or your goal in mind, you know, go ahead and segment it a little bit go into the CRM or the database or wherever and say, you know, if these two things are true, these two numbers are between these ranges and this criteria is false, um, put these people on a list and send this message. At least there's some degree of thinking about, you know, what's in it for the other people who has a reasonable expectation of hearing from me on this topic. Who's most likely to say, yes, can I reach my number, my goal, my click count, my revenue count, my conversion count, my reply count, whatever we're, whatever we're counting, the easy things to count. Um, and by the way, there are things that lead to the things that are easy to count that can't be counted, immeasurables, trust being the foremost among them. And, you know, setting that aside or acting like because we can't measure it, it doesn't really matter. Um, or that will just take care of itself, I think is also a bit myopic, um, especially if we're thinking about what is going to get someone to open the next email or click the next ad or reply to this thing or fill out the survey. It, it's trust. It's all trust. And so I know we all know this intuitively, but so often we're behaving in ways, especially digitally and virtually online and online in ways that we wouldn't in person. We've already hit that point, but in ways that aren't necessarily best for the other people. And so that's the clean air is, is doing our best to make it really easy for people to understand why is this in front of me? Who is it from? What is my opportunity here? And how do I proceed? And the more that we can do that with things like identity and verification, just to hit what you said before, you know, can, does someone have a reasonable sense of this is from who it says it's from? So that's the other thing. Someone listening might be saying, I do all those things. I'm amazing at this. My business model sp supports a practically bespoke approach to each person. I don't have everything completely automated. I'm not treating everybody in a completely uniform matter, manner, but you have to know that the feeds and the inboxes and all these other places that you're showing up, you're showing up in a noisy and polluted place. And we still, even if you're uh, the most forthright, upstanding actor relative to these concepts, you have to know that you still are not getting the benefit of the doubt. You're still not getting the the attention you, you may deserve because you're arriving alongside all these other things that are not necessarily in people's best interest. Okay. So I want to come back to trust, but before we go there, um, in your book, you talk about the four pillars. Um, of human-centered communication. Will you take our audience through those four pillars and maybe give us an example of each? Uh, sure. So the, the pillars are guidance, identity, verification, and engagement. They basically wrap around one in the middle that is relationships. So that spells give or giver, and you might say, oh, that's kind of fun and clever. Um, but you know, once I think once I explain them, it'll make even more sense. So guidance, again, this is a new... Uh, in some ways, this is a timeless approach because we can talk about the golden rule and the platinum rule and some of these other ideas that have been present for, you know, in the case of the golden rule for millennia in basically every single religious and philosophical system that attempts to answer why are we here and how are we supposed to live? Every single one of them arrives at some version of the golden rule. But um, you know, so there's a timeless element here, but there's also a timely one too. Um and so with that, we start with guidance, this idea that this does require some new skills, uh, especially to the degree that we get into video and being effective using video to enhance the next two pillars. Um, and, and we see this not as, you know, look to the authors of this book as, as the guides to this, although I'd certainly welcome anyone's direct communication on these themes or topics. And I do come in a spirit of help and service, um, but look to each other, look to the practitioners, look to the people who are modeling behavior that you would like to demonstrate yourself. Look to larger organizations that somehow still manage to make it feel um, like they do know who you are and tend on average to give you things that are super helpful and interesting and relevant and help you take the next step. So guidance, um, look to establish guidance. We're looking to start a conversation here. Um, look to practitioners that you respect um, along these themes and 
let's all do this together. We're looking to move business culture in a positive direction for better business outcomes as well. Identity. This is one of those things, uh, again, whether or not we are already a trusted source in a lot of people's minds and experiences and the kind of mental frameworks we create, the shortcuts we create to say, swipe, delete, swipe, delete. So, oh, no, it's Nathan. I like hearing from Nathan. I'm going to keep this one, right? Um, that's based on identity. Like I, I've had, I have a sense that I know you. Um, and so the, to the degree that we can make it easy for people to understand who we are, what our motivation is, that we have their best interests in mind, can we identify ourselves? This is again, where kind of video comes in, especially a personal video that is, um, you know, there's no faking the fact that if I sent you a video, Nathan, thanking you for my time on Monetization Nation, sharing a couple things that I enjoyed about the conversation, that I made this just for you and that you have a greater sense of who I am. So making it clear who we are as individuals and as organizations helps build familiarity and starts that pattern of trust um, and engagement and positive reputation such that we have faster access to people's time and attention in the future. That's what this is all about. If we're playing an attention game, now I'm getting a little bit ahead to the trust conversation, but you know, if we're playing in a, an attention game, yeah, I just need to, I need, I need to get people's attention more quickly. I need to break through, but we don't have a plan to create this identity, to verify that identity, um, and to create some level of engagement. Then we're on a fool's errand because we're teaching people that we're not worth their time and attention. Um, because all we've done is planned on how to get their time and attention. We need to reward that in order to build this familiarity, trust, and engagement cycle. So Guidance, identity, verification, which is, um, again, verifying that we are who we say we are, that the opportunity is a legit opportunity, that I do have your best interests in mind, that I do believe in the things that I'm saying, that I do have some sense of who you are and that I actually am here in a spirit of service and, and support and help. Um, and the more we can provide signals and support for our identity and our motivation, then we are verifying that this is something safe for people to do. Quick aside, that language is really, really important. This idea of making it safe for people to say yes, that's what identity and verification are all about and saying yes is the fourth pillar engagement. Humans for millennia have looked to one another typically physically face to face. It's only been in the past handful of generations that we could really break ourselves apart from physical communication, you know, aside from things like letter writing, perhaps, but um, in telegraph and whatever. But we've over millennia become very comfortable and confident and safe in judging other people's intent by reading their face, the, any discrepancies between what they're saying and how they're saying it, um, how they're posturing themselves, whether their hands are behind their back, perhaps you know, holding a weapon, or whether their hands are forward in a way that we can see them and know that they come in peace, practically speaking, right? We're very adept at judging people's motivation and intent. Uh, we have, again, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years in evolved training in this skill. And yet when we go into these digital, virtual, and online spaces, we very often are lacking that data. And so it's difficult for people to verify our identity and verify our intent. That's where video can really help us again. And so um, we need to make it easy for people to say yes, create engagement, which is conversation, make it open, make it two-way, seek to further understand so that we can then you know, um, guide ourselves and guide other people more effectively at the core is relationship. Um, and there we are with Give and Giver. Thank you so much, Ethan, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. To learn more about or connect with Ethan, you can visit his website at bombbomb.com. That's B-O-M-B-B-O-M-B.com. Or you can get his books on amazon.com. And there's links to each of these sites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. You can also get a free copy of my ebook, Passion Marketing, and learn how you can become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. You can also subscribe to Monetization Nation on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group, and on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining me for this episode, and I wish you success at humanizing your business. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.